five, four, three, two, one. But who's counting, right? And his name is Major. Oh, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Major Garrett. From the nation's capital. Major, fantastic. It's the takeout. This is a major achievement. With CBS News Chief Washington Correspondent. Major Garrett. Yes, CBS. Yes, hi. Major Garrett. Major, that's nonsense. And you should know better. Is Major out of the doghouse? <laughs> the answer is yes. Welcome to the very best part of my broadcast week. I'm Major Garrett. It's great to have you here at the takeout. You know, one of the things about this show, yes, it's politics, policy, pop culture. But look, it revolves around me. I have, at a low level, convening authority in Washington, D.C. Whether I deserve to or not, I have it. And what I try to do with that convening authority in service of you is to bring the most interesting people on the most relevant topics as regularly as I can to these microphones so you can make up your own mind about what we're talking about. I promised you last week we would have two weeks back-to-back on what is emerging as a potentially pivotal issue in these midterm elections and possibly going forward abortion rights in America. Last week, Cecile Richards, who for many years was president of Planned Parenthood, I promised you we'd have the other side of that conversation. Well, that's starting right now with Marjorie Dannenfelser, president of Susan B. Anthony Pro-Life America. Marjorie, it's great to see you. Thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me. So I want to have my audience get to know you a little bit. And I read something in a profile written in the Washington Post about you that while you were in college, at Duke University, you were the leader of pro-choice Republicans. <laughs> and then something happened. Mm-hmm. What happened and explain to my audience your evolution on this particular issue. Mm-hmm. Well, I was very pro-choice and a leader among pro-choice Republicans, without question. Um, I was very libertarian. Uh, what happened was I was really taken on by really smart people, mainly people with a good philosophy background and frankly, people that I really considered peers in a lot of ways, took me on on the fundamental question of what is an abortion. If you're gonna talk about it all the time, you need to be clear on what it is. And it was their conviction that the, clear, the more clarity was brought into, that, uh, into what that thing is, uh, the more my mind would move. I found that it took a while, but eventually I had to address the question, what is actually happening in that? In, in that abortion. I came in as pre-med, total disaster, <laughs> moved over to philosophy, and philosophy really served that uh, because the premises of your argument have to all, all pull together to really come to a conclusion. My conclusion event, eventually was, or, or uh, short term was, you know what, I know that it's the beginning of all of our lives, I know that piece. Uh, but I'm really not ready to go there quite yet. But one thing that I definitely am clear that I wouldn't do is I would not go into a darkened room with a machine gun and spray bullets if I thought that there was some person with equal moral dignity to my own um, that might be hurt. And so that was kind of the seed of the beginning. Uh, and and I really did find that, that the, the encumbrance between changing from being 100% all in on the pro-choice position to changing was a little bit of cognitive dissonance. That was the encumbrance. It was, I'm not going to think about this because I am committed to it and because it's so important that I believe my body, my choice, that mantra, um, that I'm not going to go there. And it would be disloyal of me to women to even go deeper on the issue. I really did think that. Mm-hmm. So. I think it was an honest intellectual, and then eventually uh, the faith piece of it was certainly important. But it was first and foremost an intellectual um, conversation. And the faith piece of it, uh, as I read, you were raised an Episcopalian and mm-hmm. converted to Catholicism. That's right. How did the faith piece fit into this? Mm-hmm. I think what, well, what happened first was the abortion position. And I think what happens is once you, especially at that age in college, Something come because uh, something is disrupted in terms of your worldview, mm-hmm. and then it's really easy for a lot of things to become disrupted. Like, am I really looking closely at the rest of the premises in my life as well? And so, people around me, Catholics around me, but then also just reading a lot, really, and and a lot of prayer brought me to to that position as well. Clearly, it was an op- I felt it was an opening of the heart that allowed me to listen and look at things that I didn't formerly believe. So it was a pretty, it was a a complete turnaround. So I want to let everyone know we're recording this on October 17th. 
We are at The Point. That's our host restaurant. You see it arrayed around behind us. We will have some appetizers brought to the table momentarily. Anna, our great server, will be helping us with that. So for those in my audience who may have heard of it but not quite sure what it is, what is Susan B. Anthony Pro-Life America? What does it do? What does it support? Mm -hmm. Is it political? Is it policies? What is it? It's political and policy. Uh, founded to elect primarily pro-life women in the very beginning because that was the great underrepresented uh, population. Um, the, the idea was to strengthen the political arm of the pro-life movement, which basically didn't have one. A very organic movement, lots of people, lots of organization in almost every community that you can think of, but not any political leverageability. So there might be the will, but there wasn't the way to elect pro-life people that, it, that is specifically in the beginning um, were a reflection of women, the majority of women, but certainly an underrepresented uh, group. Emily's List did a great job. I give them uh, all kinds of, of, have all kinds of respect for their methods because they did the opposite, not their goal, obviously. So the, the two prongs, the women and the political center, and once we started to grow with that idea, kind of against everybody's predictions, we expanded our, our reach. We, um, we started doing independent expenditures in battleground districts and then eventually battleground states uh, in Senate elections and then battlegrounds, uh, presidential battlegrounds, just basically taking that, uh, all of that strength and that momentum and leveraging that door to door among Republicans, Democrats and independents to win battleground races. So How long have it. you been involved with Susan B. Anthony? Since the beginning. Okay. Um, there were there was a which is what year? Ninety one. Okay. But it was about like fifteen minutes after they began with a really interesting group of women, a Quaker uh, woman named Rachel McNair, a real pro life feminist, Helen Alvarez, another great pro life Catholic feminist, uh, and a who and then a Democrat friend who was also so a kind of eclectic group of people. As I explained to you, this show is heard in radio stations and markets across the country. Mm -hmm. New York City is one of them. Yeah. Union, Tennessee is another. That's the kind of reach we have. Mm -hmm. <laughs> in Union, Tennessee, pro-life feminists may not land in an awkward way, but in New York City, someone, what are you talking about, a pro-life feminist? Mm -hmm. What are you talking about? A pro-life feminist would be Susan B. Anthony, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, Victoria Woodhull, Alice Paul. These were trailblazers in bringing women into uh, the political arena, obviously allowing us to vote, number one, but then also advancing the cause of women. And they believed in the inextricable, inextricable connect between the human rights of the woman and the human rights of the child. That, that bond was not broken. And in fact, they believed so strongly that abortion was the exploitation of women, that it was woman and child against man often in terms of uh, the, sen uh, the battle over the human rights for the woman. Susan B. Anthony uh, said that... Um, oh, the appetizers the, have arrived. That's very yeah. good news. <laughs> yeah. That is good. Oh my gosh, that looks so good. <laughs> I'm going for that bacon first. Um, the, uh, Susan B. Anthony said uh, the, the act of abortion will burden her conscience in life, her soul in the grave, but thrice guilty is the one who drove her to the dreadful deed. Alice Paul called abortion the, uh, the ultimate exploitation of women. These were not weak-minded women easily manipulated by men. And these were not women who were saying this because of at lack of access to health care, like some of my friends uh, on the feminist other side uh, posit. They, they, were, they were making a deep moral human rights argument for woman and child and their connection, and that you could never build rights on the broken rights of another human being. And that is Human Rights 101 across the board. And does that match your philosophical evolution? Yes, indeed. Yeah. Uh, in terms of Seeing this advancing. in a human rights context yes. from the beginning, it's, in other words. Yes, from the very beginning. I saw it as a pro-life feminist position. That's why uh, Feminist for Life was such a, is, is an organization that uh, I created a lot of the philosophical foundation for the political work that we do, and why that, to me, was such a magnet in the very beginning. That is the voice of Marjorie Dannenfelser. She is the president of Susan B. Anthony Pro-Life America. The appetizers here at the point have arrived. We will probably dig into them ever so slightly, maybe <laughs> ravenously during the break. More of our conversation with Marjorie when we come back. I'm Major Garrett. Segment two of The Takeout coming up in just one moment. And it was the biggest vote 
since Roe v. Wade, in our opinion, because it would lead to the, uh, a, a proliferation of abortions beyond which we had seen mm. before. From CBS News, this is The Takeout with Major Garrett. Welcome back to The Takeout. I'm Major Garrett. The point is our restaurant, the delicious appetizers, which I, I said we would dump into. We have jumped into. <laughs> They're very good. They're here. They may not last till segment four. We'll find out. <laughs> Marjorie Dannenfelser is my special guest. This is our second of two weeks in a row on the topic of abortion. We spent the first segment going about the philosophical aspect of it. Mm -hmm. well, I want to talk a little bit about, since you said you've been with Susan B. Anthony since the beginning, 1991. I arrived in Washington in 1990, and I want to talk about something that was true then, it's not true now. Mm -hmm. There were a good number of pro-life so-called Democrats mm -hmm. in Congress in 1990 when I first arrived in Washington. Yeah. It was a rather difficult conversation within the Democratic Party in 1992 when Bill Clinton became the nominee about who would or would not get a featured speaking position at the Democratic National Convention. Good memory. But, but over time, the number of quote-unquote pro-life Democrats has diminished. Mm -hmm. And the number of pro-choice Republicans has also diminished. Mm -hmm. Walk my audience through what you've observed, not just philosophically, but practically with what I've just described. Yeah, so, so the philosophical piece we were talking about in the last segment was also why I was very attracted to the pro-life Democrat position. They came from it from a totally different, pers not a totally different, but a, a complementary perspective and looking out for the little guy. You know, the guy who was advancing Social Security and welfare reform it, with, was within, also the, Within the mm -hmm. larger aspect, because I experienced this personally, yeah. the social justice component right. of Catholicism. Exactly. That's exactly what it was. And and so I worked for a pro-life Democrat. It was my first job on Capitol Alan Monaghan, Alan right? Monaghan. Uh, I did not, I, I didn't think of myself as a Democrat at that, at that point, and I still don't, but what I did love and respect was that center of his philosophy. And, and all the guys, Jim Overstar, Mary Rose O'Carr, there's a whole group of people, Bart Stupak, whole group of people, Charlie Stenholm from Texas. This, I mean, this is Tim really Penny. dating. Yep, Tim, you know, very good friend yeah, of mine, a very yeah, good friend of mine. Just great human beings. And, uh, and I thought were such a vital part of the voice of the overall pro-life movement. What happened was, um, was basically after, after Clinton, the Clinton administration, uh, where the mantra was safe, legal, and rare, there was still a reluctance. It was that this is a sometimes unhappy but necessary choice. And we want to limit it to as much as that, at least that was the outward position. What happened was, was the Obama administration and Obamacare. And when the health care debate came up, there were two things that were happening. One was there was a thoroughgoing pro-choice position that was only tolerated um, was the only, uh, perceived as the only thing we could, that they could tolerate. The pro-life position was not to be tolerated in the Obama administration. And therefore, when there was an insistence upon the part of Bart Stupak and, a, and the mm -hmm. Democrats right. that I had formerly worked for, right. um, to, uh, to add an amendment that would exempt abortion from, the, from Obamacare, uh, that was basically rejected in the form of an executive order. I mean, we're really getting in the weeds mm -hmm. here. But all of my former compatriots in the Democratic Party um, had insisted that only an amendment, and they were right, only an amendment would work. When they all for they all uh, took the bait and went and, uh, on this executive order, and then we targeted all the guys that were my former buddies uh, and for for an election mm -hmm. <laughs> and after defeat. And so it, and it pretty much happened. Essentially alleging that they fell for something and that right. their position was no longer sustainably mm. opposed to abortion rights. That's right. And it was the biggest, you know, the biggest vote since Roe v. Wade, in our opinion, because it would lead to the, uh, a, a proliferation of abortions beyond which we had seen mm. before. And so the polarization became almost complete not long after that. And that is a, a, a real grief. For the pro-life movement. It's a grief. It's a grief for the pro-life movement because um, human rights isn't about party, and it has and it has many uh, as 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 complex and important as it is. It also contains that many approaches and voices: mm -hmm. men, women, m minorities, parties, religions. Um, there are 
all that have human rights in their heart have a different way of, of promoting it and, and communicating. So yeah, it, it was a grief, but you know what you do if you're a, if you're a political organization or a PAC, you can't grieve too long. You got to go ahead and act. So you know we call it the velvet hammer. We we love you and we but we are gonna um, we're going to reward our friends and we're going to make sure that punish your enemies. Punish your enemies. Yeah, that's what it is. So I want to ask you something about terminology. Um, you use pro-choice, pro-life. Mm -hmm. That has been the terminology on both sides of this issue, almost since Roe versus Wade was decided. Mm -hmm. My network, CBS, doesn't allow, does not permit either of those because they are feel they are freighted. They are sort of weighted with language, of language that is chosen by both sides mm -hmm. and unconsciously favorable to both sides or possibly mm -hmm. consciously favorable. So when I talk about it at CBS, our standards say, I have to say you are in support of abortion rights mm -hmm. or opposed to abortion rights. Mm -hmm. Trying to find the most neutral, even though it's much more lengthy, yeah. it's easier to say pro-choice, pro-life, yeah. but we don't say that, we say that. Yeah. Is there anything about that approach, the language mm -hmm. and our concerted effort to try yeah. to find something that is not putting a mm -hmm. media thumb on the scale that you find either <laughs> laudable or objectionable? You were the first journalist to ever ask me that question, and I consider it a great act of respect. And it's the reason that I say pro-choice, even though I don't think it's a matter of choice. Mm -hmm. I think it's, you're, we're talking about the abortion issue, and you're talking about whether you're for it or against it. So in my pro-life community, they mostly say pro-abortion. I think it's. I think you call people what they call themselves, mm -hmm. and I actually think that that's an act of respect. And I think you're more likely likely to elicit honesty if you don't charge when you're talking to someone, especially charge up the conversation with something that they feel is not mm -hmm. what they call themselves. Mm -hmm. So I think um, yes, I am pro-life. I'm also, and and I wouldn't be have I wouldn't have that label unless there were the abortion issue, and uh, and I weren't opposed to it. Mm -hmm. So I. I, I think pro-life fits. Also, think anti-abortion rights. I mean, it doesn't tell the whole story, but I, but it is part of the story. Right. We put love at the center, and we're for life, but we're against for pro-abortion rights. Is that how you label it? So supportive of abortion rights, opposed to abortion About, rights. That's just a lot of words. But yeah, it is a lot yeah. of words. It's one of those <laughs> rare instances where, like, no, we need to add more words to yeah. try to a achieve a, a kind of level of yeah. neutrality. I have to admit, I'm sure there are pro-life people listening to this that disagree with me, but I, I find that a neutral ground. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, but I do appreciate the uh, question, and and it's so funny. I, I probably would be better, if I were going to try to be more neutral, I'd parrot your, your words, but... I, when I talk to Cecile Richards, mm -hmm. which I would love to do, right, um, and I would think it would be better if we did more, if we did often, mm -hmm. I would not call her pro-abortion because that's not how she perceives herself, perhaps. Right, yeah. right. And to that question of choice, when she was on the program, and I'm not speaking for Cecile Richards, I'm just saying mm -hmm. what she said, for her, there is something deeply intrusive that is injurious of human rights to force someone to do something with their body that they don't want to do. Yeah. Address that. I would, I 100% agree. If I uh, thought that you should get uh, an appendectomy or have some procedure that were, or something that was even elective, and I forced you to do it, it would be wrong. But if you were talking about two people, not the equivalent of an appendectomy, not the equivalent of getting your tonsils out or any form of elective surgery, if you're talking about two people, you're not talking about one body. We're talking about two people with a completely separate set of DNA, uh, two people who have uh, uh, opposite genders, <laughs> often, half the time, opposite mm. genders, completely different human beings. So it is not the equivalent of a part of your body. And in fact, pretty soon, it will. the only difference is whether you're, I mean, I, I think it's really interesting how, I, I mean it when I say interesting, that it's it's the few, it's the only so-called healthcare uh, that that your view of what the thing is, uh, your 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 mental perspective on what the thing is defines whether you're going to get it or not. Mm -hmm. So if I think that my four-month-old entity in, that is growing inside me separately from me is not a human being, then I will be happy for, hope for it to be destroyed. But if I think it's the baby I've been waiting for, 
for most of my life. Mm -hmm. Then it's celebration. We're talking about gender reveal parties. We're mm -hmm. talking, we're getting everything decorated. It cannot be that my mind is that po powerful. We're going to pick up on that and the question of agency and human rights more deeply. Mm -hmm. When we come back, I'm Major Garrett. Marjorie Dannenfelser is our special guest, Segment 3 of The Takeout, coming up in just one moment. How every successful human rights movement in our nation has succeeded was being, uh, was, was incrementally. From CBS News, this is The Takeout with Major Garrett. Welcome back to The Point. That is our host restaurant. So happy to be here. Appetizers are on the table. They are delicious. Marjorie Dannenfelser is our guest. Right before we went to the break, you were talking about the mind can't be that powerful mm -hmm. to decide what this thing is and therefore my orientation to it, mm -hmm. celebration or not. Let me ask you about the question of agency. For someone who is a child or a teen or a late teen who is a victim of incest, mm -hmm. their level of agency is almost non-existent. Yeah. If you're a rape victim, your level of agency, criminally speaking, does not exist. You don't have agency. You are a victim in both cases. Does that victim status in any way philosophically or practically, morally to you, alter the terrain that you just outlined before we went to break? Well, I think, number one, almost, I think legislators see that there is, uh, that there, there are lines that, uh, they don't want to draw because those are the difficult questions. Those mm -hmm. are the hard cases. They're also the hard cases that make bad law, mm -hmm. right? You make a general, make a law, and you don't eliminate the law because of the hard cases. So I think those are areas for public for for the, for public debate, and in general, um, yeah, there there are exceptions in a lot of places. Now, I don't think that uh, that the uh, uh, that the the agency is uh, of the of the mother um, is uh, is fully embraced, and uh, and there should be someone advocating for the children that are that are also victims. They themselves are victims. I happen to know a lot of people who were who are a result of of rape. Mm -hmm. Now I also know a lot of the a lot of the uh, and I know them. There are people that I've. That I Obviously, the, the, the victim yeah. made of the mother made a choice, and she made a choice. Uh, to, so to I, I would bring just that, say, bring that pregnancy, mm -hmm. its origins, mm -hmm. evil, but nevertheless brought that child to term. That's right. So what I really think, where we are in the nation right now, because we're in this, we're in this fifty-one state converse, fifty-one front conversation, mm -hmm. federal, right. and then every. That it's important for uh, consensus to be built in every one of those places. In many cases, allies and uh, of ours that we will help elect have several exceptions, and mm -hmm. those being one because of how tender that difficulty is. But the but the predominance has to be on the 99% uh, for us to begin after 50 years to start legislating in a civilized way that would eventually get us, and I hope sooner rather than later, on par with the most civilized nations in Europe, 47 out of 50 who limit abortion before 15 weeks, and most of those at 12 weeks. Would you be comfortable with an America that had a federal limit at 12 or 15 weeks? Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, I wouldn't stop there, but I think it would be an amazing beginning. I mean, think of the difference we've had. We have zero limits, and now we say got to 15 or, or 12. Or heartbeat. Statistically speaking, mm -hmm. isn't that when most abortions in this country occur in right now? In the first now? trimester. In the first trimester, right? So in Europe, you know, again, like 47 out of 50 nations. So, so as a practical yeah. matter, we're yeah. almost already there uh, as a lived experience, statistically, right? No. From, well, I mean, what matters to us, so, save it's even uh, 20 weeks or 15 weeks. We're talking about saving 50, at 15, uh, 55,000 a year. That's a lot of children. That feels several football stadiums so i don't take these numbers lightly mm -hmm, and what mm -hmm. i really think is that this human rights movement like many others it already has been incremental it's not a matter of whether i say it should be mm -hmm. it is incremental and what i do i think we should stop at at 15 or 12 no i think every child should be protected i'm not pretending that i don't mm -hmm. i do 
Um, but I'm just saying that uh, this is how human rights causes, how every successful human rights movement in our nation has succeeded was being, uh, was, was incrementally. I mean, mm -hmm. if you study the suffrage movement, uh, the, uh, the uh, even child labor movement, <laughs> like uh, how civil rights evolved. Meaning you take mm -hmm. small steps in pursuit steps. of a larger goal. Yeah, always, always do that. And never without losing sight of the goal. You know, the goal mm -hmm. is, is to protect and serve all people, love them both. Do we count abortions accurately in this country? No, we don't. Because there really has not been an interest, a self-interest on the part of, of many state governors and state legislatures to, to, uh, to uh, call those numbers. They don't want to be um, they don't So the be CDC out. has one set of numbers, and the Guttmacher mm -hmm. Institute has another set of mm -hmm. numbers. Uh, do you find either one of them more reliable than another? Guttmacher is closer. And our own research arm called Charlotte Lozier Institute uh, is, is, I think, surpassing now Alan Guttmacher in, in getting those numbers right. What's the difficulty? The difficulty is the lack of reporting requirement. Um, because of the sensitive nature of it, there's no desire to actually report that. And if you don't report that, then you can't get to, you know, that's, an, that's important. If you really think it's a health care issue, mm -hmm. it's something that should be reported. We need to know what we're talking about. We need to know the statistics and data. And one thing that has never been tracked is like repeat abortions. And, and that is something that is actually a study from our own research arm is uh, studying uh, Medicaid data. If one, having, having your, your first pregnancy end abortion leads to an average of four abortions in your lifetime as a mother, which is an enormous statistic and shows the, the thinking that, again, I think it becomes a cognitive dissonance that you, you uh, I don't think women go into having sex thinking, oh, I'll just get an abortion. It won't be a big deal, generally. But if you had one, it becomes that. And that's when the whole idea of, of rare is, is almost impossible. And I'm glad you brought that up again. We asked Cecile Richards about that formulation, yeah. which at the time was considered almost an act of rhetorical brilliance on the part of Bill Clinton. Safe, legal, and rare. And I asked Cecile if she's comfortable with that. She said, actually, no. Mm -hmm. And I said, do you find the rare <clears throat> part patriarchal? And she said, I do. Mm -hmm. Are you comfortable with safe, legal, and rare? Or do you, would you prefer safe, legal, and non-existent? <laughs> I think we're talking about managing death, so you want it to be more rare. If it's a, if it's a, it's if it's safe because it, it saves the life of a woman who's being butchered by an abortionist, like the, uh, like the clinics in Pennsylvania were so horrific there. Then yeah, you want to make sure that you're you're at least saving her health. Um, and uh, no, I, I actually think the legal. It's exactly the conversation we have on the table right, right now. now. Right. And so when it, when it is legal, if it, and if it's legal, is the, is the question. But I, I actually think um, that it's very interesting that she would not have said that and 10 years ago mm -hmm. or 20 years ago. And there was a point, much, I bet you noticed it, but very few people did notice it. It was a debate in the pro-choice community when they were really on the, on the ropes and they were worried that they were, it was around the time of the partial birth abortion debate. Mm -hmm. They were quite concerned that they were losing the debate because there was this perceived humanity of the, of the thing, mm -hmm. of the thing. It seems like maybe people are starting to say that, it's, uh, that there's humanity there. And so they really started to rework their own language and their, their own rhetoric to try to counter that. How, and I remember very clearly, it was uh, in Salon Magazine that they had this public conversation. It was, how are we gonna, how are gonna we regain in the pro-choice movement the moral high ground? I think what they found is that they can't. They had to make unapologetic abortion up until the end and paid for by taxpayers a, a moral good of its own or they weren't going to win at all. And I think that's a high bar. It's a very high bar to convince the whole, the, convince the American public, or at least convince battleground voters, <laughs> that abortion up into the end, paid for by taxpayers, is the moral high ground. I think that you can only get a certain number of people leverage in an election that will, that will cling on to that idea. And when you say, uh, taxpayer funded that's not always the case it's not always the case but it is the case it's what they want 
it's what there is what it was uh, Hillary Clinton's one of her last closing arguments in the in the debate with um, with Trump was that uh, that all abortions because they are just basically what any procedure is an appendectomy it should be paid for it's something only women will get so as health care as health care right 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 that is the voice of Marjorie Dannenfelser our special guest we are at the point our appetizers are here we're gonna dig into them more during the break we come back I want to talk to you about a conversation that Mark Short asked us to have with you on this very program <laughs> oh, great, about Mark. three weeks ago. I'm Major Garrett, segment for the take. I'll come up in just one second. Where do you draw the line mm-hmm. is the question I think we need to be asking the Warnocks of the world, the Mark Kellys of the world, mm-hmm. um, and the rest of our opponents in this election. From CBS News, this is The Takeout with Major Garrett. Welcome back to The Takeout. The Point is our host restaurant. Happy to be here. Marjorie Dannenfelser is our guest. So on this program, about three weeks ago, I've lost track, maybe four weeks ago, Mark Short, who worked for President Trump as Director of Legislative Operations, then he was Vice President Pence's Chief of Staff, said, I want you to have, hope Marjorie can come on your show. Oh, uh-huh. I'd like you to ask her what she thinks about some Republicans, post Dobbs, who began mm-hmm. to scrub their websites from their of their pro-life, quote-unquote, positions, mm-hmm. and began to back away from that. He goes, I imagine she's displeased with that, <laughs> disturbed by that. So, on behalf of Mark Short, who sat at the table with us at a different restaurant about a month ago, are you? <laughs> to quote uh, Lady Catherine de Berg in Pride and Prejudice, I am most seriously displeased. Um, most seriously displeased that people who think that this is the death of a human being would all of a sudden see it politically inconvenient to be part of their of, of what they advocate. Most seriously displeased. That I mean, they, they would advocated be, for the Dobbs decision. Then it's decided, and then they yeah. start running for the hills. Right. So when it's theoretical and useful, fantastic. We'll put you at the head of the bus. When it is real, when the consequences affect real people, we're gonna make we're gonna kind of inch you to the middle, maybe the back of the bus, and make sure that everything you do is done in quiet. But don't expect me to be an advocate for what you're talking about, or at, or at a very minimum, um, don't ex- you know just here the thing that I dislike the most was this idea that somehow we're gonna let the country just figure it out. And uh, and then maybe we'll I don't want to get too it. involved no, now. No, no, on no. The and specifics. then yeah, yeah. Let Those just are uncomfortable. Let, yeah, I they think make you've me heard sweat. words. <laughs> I think you've you've seen this in many other issues, and to experience it ourselves has been a very serious disappointment. I think that letting the letting the dust settle without being a vocal advocate means you let the dust settle on the wrong side. It means that you are you're not. But you know, obviously, Mike Pence has not been that person. Oh, clearly not. Um, what would you say about the reporting and the rhetoric that's come from Herschel Walker on this very question in the Senate race in Georgia? Well, I think he, uh, he, he, he has found his voice. I really do think he has found his voice on, uh, on what he's advocating for. Now, if you're talking about his personal life, mm-hmm. this, I, this I can't account for, and this Does I don't Does that raise questions of- about the stability of his voice with his own history, which now seems to keep mm-hmm. evolving in the direction of the original story. I mean, he said, yeah, okay, I didn't write the check. I don't know anything about it. Well, I wrote the check, but it wasn't for this. I mean, it, it seems like what he said was a lie may be closer to the truth than originally suggested by Herschel I, Walker. Look, I, I am not God, and I cannot see into his heart and know the, know the whole truth and all of that. What I do know is what his position is. It has been unyielding. And yes, I can see that it would be most seriously disturbing the, about the if, if any of it, it is true. But I think we have a, an obvious distinction and a choice. We have Warnock, who's a pastor, who would rather, you know, in Walker's words, would rather abort than baptize so many babies in the black community, especially that um, that that contrast of, uh, is so out of sync with Georgia and Herschel Walker, who is a flawed hero. <laughs> um, and a flaw, and, and uh, like we all are in many ways, um, is is a far greater alternative when it comes to this issue. Like we've dealt with a lot of imperfect candidates. I think you remember a few in presidential races recently. <laughs> yes. And in the end, you know, sometimes it's tough. But you, but we're talking about. 
policy. We're talking about votes coming up. We're talking about the balance of the Senate. And we're talking about the consequence of that, which is the life or death of millions of kids, we think, and the service to their moms. And uh, I think if Cecile were sitting with us, she might say, well, this is part of my problem with your position, Marjorie, respectfully. When you have political actors who are, can be so fungible, doesn't that validate my central concern? And I'm not, again, not speaking mm -hmm. for Cecile Richards, yeah, but I've heard this said. Yeah. If you put this in the hands of scattershot, weak need, spineless politicians on either side, the underlying question gets lost and it just becomes a political football. And is that really the place we want this central question to be resolved? Well, that's spoken like somebody who has never seen that at least at some point. And again, I'm not advocating for them. I, I'm just I know. describing I'm their talking position. talking about her position. Yeah. That at some point, a baby is a baby. Now, if would she say that about a, uh, the just a baby who is six months in utero? Would she say the same thing? That it, you have to pick and choose who can advocate for that for that person, I think we'd be happy for even a flawed hero that was sticking up for the baby at that point. Sixth, eighth, ninth. So when do, where do you draw the line mm -hmm. is the question I think we need to be asking the Warnocks of the world, the Mark Kellys of the world, mm -hmm. um, it, and the rest of our opponents in this election, is where do you draw the line? That is the, that contrast between where Democrats are in this election versus where our candidates are in this election is a contrast you pray for in politics and might never get. It's a 72-10 split, according to the Harvard-Harris poll. It's a 72% of the people think you should stop abortion before 15 weeks. 10% of the people mm -hmm. think it should be up until birth. What about the idea that life be begins at conception and anything later than that can't be permitted? I mean, that is what Mississippi leads, believes. It's what the consensus in Alabama is. It's what I believe. It's what the pro-life movement advocates for. But the moment that we're living in right now is a gift after 50 years, and that is to build consensus around the most ambitious for life that we can possibly be in each of these states, which isn't all of them, we know, mm -hmm. and then also on the federal level. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I, I, I'm I, not saying that uh, that I, I, what I, what I think and what the pro-life movement does respect is out of 50 years in the yearning for a democratic process that it will allow us um, to allow the will of the people to make its way into the law. And so that's why 15 weeks on the federal level, kind of a perhaps consensus there, um, zero at conception is, is the prerogative now and also the law of the land in several states as is 15 in Florida. And as we talk about the law of the land in several states, States like California, mm -hmm. the governor of California, Gavin Newsom, has paid for billboards in Texas, mm -hmm. Mississippi, Alabama, and elsewhere saying, need an abortion? California is here to help you. Mm -hmm. Do you find that a subversion of state law? Do you think those women should not be allowed to go to another state to obtain an abortion? Where do you think that rubber beats the road? Well, it is certainly a, a direct subversion of state law, but do I believe that we track women and their movements? Absolutely not. I also think that those billboards are the number one lobbying tool for a federal limit that is reasonable because, of course, California will allow it up until birth. And they and clearly they're being paid for, not just in California, but paying for every abortion in the nation or Californians could be uh, could be footing the bill for. I think it means that, look, there's a civilized limit. We disagree all over the map. I know what I believe. I know what Cecile Richards on your show last week believes. But I know that we don't, neither of us necessarily represent opinion in the, in the nation, what consensus is. But where we are in the, um, where our, our advantage right now in all these elections is that we, is that we are willing to form consensus, and the abortion movement is not. The pro-choice movement is not. They lose one week of abortion access, and they've lost everything because of Roe versus Wade being overturned. When we gain weeks, we gain every single time. It's more than we ever had. So we're, we really stand to win in terms of the political spin, without question, in terms of that contrast, but we also uh, stand to win in terms of policy, 
children's lives saved, and moms actually served with uh, ways that will actually help them. That is the voice of Marjorie Dannenfelser. She's been our special guest this week, President Susan B. Anthony, Pro-Life America. I'm Major Garrett. For our radio audience, we need to say farewell. For those of you on CBS News Streaming and our beloved podcast platforms, please stay with us for the Takeout Outtake Especial. We'll see you next week. I'm on a long drive. Martina McBride, um, Keith Urban, Trace Atkins. From CBS News, this is The Takeout with Major Garrett. Welcome to your Takeout Outtake Especial. I am, of course, of Major Garrett. The Point is our restaurant. Happy to be here. Marjorie Dannenfelser is our guest. Um, I know it's a fun and game segment. We're going to get to the fun and games. I promise, promise, promise. But I asked this question of Cecile Richards last week, and I want to ask it to you. 1990 was the highest number of reported and tracked abortions in our country, 1.6 million. Mm -hmm. 1990. 930,160, a steady decline. That's the last available year, 2019. Mm -hmm. A steady decline. Mm -hmm. To what do you attribute that? Sonograms. Why? One thing, because the clarity of sonograms, uh, the accessibility and use of sonograms uh, lets everybody, not just the woman who is pregnant, but everyone in their life, they see that and they don't say clump of cells, they see baby. And the more you say baby, the more you realize that there are two people involved in every abortion choice and that both deserve your love and protection. That window into the womb then has led to that strong, um, uh, that strong solidity of opinion that we leverage into the political process to, so that there's a policy con so consequence. So that's, that's technology changing the incidence right. rate. Let me talk to you about another aspect that could be under the umbrella technology also applied. According to the most recent data in 2020, that was the first year that chemical abortions mm -hmm. were more numerically visible and trackable than procedural clinical abortions. That's I'm right. not sure I have the proper terminology, but you know what I'm saying. I know what you're saying, yeah. What does that mean and what does that yeah. tell you? That means that there are many people, especially now, very willing to circumvent their state laws and by sending chemical abortions into, say, Texas and other places that have, that have uh, early limits, like heartbeat limits. And, uh, and that means that we need to go after them. Anybody that is trafficking in abortion against uh, and undermining state law, uh, number one. Number two, leaving that woman alone without a doctor um, so that she, when she has complications that are three times more likely to end up in an emergency room than, uh, than, than a uh, surgical abortion, that they're so attached to the institution of abortion that they cannot see that the needs of women, women should trump that. And that maybe they should use the same amount of money attending to her actual needs when she's, when she's pregnant rather than putting her in a moment of jeopardy. So, this is the fun and games part of the program. That didn't sound like fun and that games. That wasn't fun and games. <laughs> I readily acknowledge that. Sometimes we do a half and half in the takeout outtake especial. Our devoted listeners and viewers know that all too well. So, here's the fun and games part. Uh, we ask these questions of Cecile. We've asked them of every guest at our table. Take them in whichever order you prefer. Mm -hmm. Most influential book in your life and why. All time favorite movie. You're on a long flight or a long drive and you're really going to enjoy some music. I mean, really get into it. What kind of music, artist, or genre are you most likely to listen to? <laughs> okay, so uh, greatest movie, because, I mean, I'm sorry, greatest book. Most influential book in your book life and what? was, um, most people probably don't know it, but is The Movie Goer by Walker Percy, Louisiana writer. Such a formative time in my life kind of the idea like you live life to its fullest you want to have that peak experience all the time but life is just getting through the ordinary Wednesday afternoon how are you going to do that so it's just a little bit of a of a psychological but also kind of a spiritual journey um you know I'm like so many other people but I can't help it I just am like other people in some ways to kill a mockingbird mm -hmm. from a human rights perspective and being uh, as a movie or book or both uh, well, both, actually. Great but movie. Really thinking Trem of, tremendous book. Yeah, but the book is better than the movie. But uh, the mental images of the, of the movie mm -hmm. just are riveting to me all the time. And the courage to speak in the face of power mm -hmm. uh, and be misunderstood. The power of being happy to be misunderstood or being at peace with being misunderstood is a lesson that you know, we all want our children to learn and we want ourselves to practice, right? Mm -hmm. 
And then, uh, okay, then it is a real confession. I am a country music junkie. Mm-hmm. So Nothing when I'm wrong on with a, that. I'm on a long drive. Martina McBride, um, Keith Urban, Trace Atkins, you know. Are you a concert uh, goer? Uh, I Not as much as I used to be. <laughs> I'm getting up there. The hubbub is well, neither am I, I to be honest. I went to a Reba McIntyre concert mm-hmm. at Wolf Trap. Um, that's the last concert I went to, and it was amazing. It, it was one of the best concerts I've ever been to. And then I saw Sting. That was probably the second. Sting. That's yeah. that, 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 that must have been a great show. Oh, it was amazing. It was just him. It mm-hmm. was so good. Doesn't need to be anybody else. So you've already shared this a million times. How about you? Well, you have to go back and listen to the show. You got to go back and listen. Okay. I'm on. I'm on. Tw- I'm on record twice on okay. my own program, I'm, giving I'm gonna, those answers. I'm gonna sift you got to find them. They're they're archive achievable, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Anyone can find those answers. Marjorie Dannenfels, it's been a pleasure. Thanks Thank for joining you. us. Same for I'm me. Major Garrett. That concludes the Take Out Out Take a Special, and we will see you next week. Our thanks to the point. We'll see you next week. <laughs>